Another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Today's story, The Annie Larson. Hello there. Do you remember Annie Larson? No glamorous lady out of Grace Harbor's past, this Annie, but rather a salt cake schooner, over age, overloaded with contraband cargo, and overdue in port when she dropped her hook in Grace Harbor's mud. Yes, there's a story right out of Joseph Conrad, a tale of gun smuggling, international intrigue, the Department of Justice, and a wild escape of prisoners under investigation. Nothing that Nodhoff and Hall or Robert Louis Stevenson ever concocted from the whole fabric of the South Sea can exceed the story of the Annie Larson for sheer adventure. If you remember 1915 on Grace Harbor, July 1915, you'll recall this story. If you happen to be a member of Aberdeen's Home Guard of the First World War, you'll probably have an old musket in your attic that came from the hold of that three-masted schooner. Now, in July 1950, the World War, number one that was, had gone through its bloodiest first year. Keystone Pictures had made a motion picture on Grace Harbor, the stolen pie that called it, with good Bar Jones in the leading role and Jim Bowes in the heavy character supporting part. The Choctaw was coming to town and folks were talking about the train wreck near Tacoma in which three persons were killed. And that was the July that the little three-masted sailing schooner, the Annie Larson, sailed into Grays Harbor. The Annie Larson was a ship of 326 tons built in Port Blake. Blakely in 1881. Her designer had built her for the hard knocks of the sea, not for running before the wind, as she was famous in length of the coast as a slow sailor. Well, so much for the Annie Larson. I'm going to ask Dick Crombie to say a few words from our sponsor and then spin a yarn that has everything a good story should have. In March 1915, the Annie Larson set into San Diego Harbor to pick up a mysterious cargo. At that time, she was sailing under the under Captain Schl Schluter, under Captain Schluter. A supercargo named Paige met the ship in San Diego with a character for the next voyage. Paige had no bones about what he wanted with the ship. He had a cargo of rifles purchased from the United States government. They were packed in boxes and billed as foodstuffs, cotton goods, and tinwares. The rifles were intended for the Mexican rebels in the revolt under Pancho Villa and causing Uncle Sam some consternation along the southern border. And when they were stowed about March 5, 1915, the Annie Larson was towed out of San Diego's harbor with only the barest running lights and dropped off just outside Fort Rosecrans. They slipped past a Mexican ship named the Carzana and by daylight they were standing well down the California coast headed for Sirocco Island, a dry sun-baked point of land off the Mexican coast. The island without water or a sign of life. About the time they arrived at the island, which was to have been a short stay, staging point, the winds died and for nearly 40 days there wasn't enough wind to fan the sail. The little vessel wallowed in the ground swells and be calmed. Well after 30 days, the crew went on to half rations of water and was cut down to a cup a day. Finally, on April 17, 1915, a breeze filled her sails 
and she headed for the nearest port to fill her water tanks and replenish her depleted food lockers. And the nearest port was Carranza, held Acapulco. She bluffed her way into port and got the water and provisions, but there was something about the ship that attracted the attention of the lo Loyalist garrison, and she was about to sail. Mexican authorities ordered the ship and crew held for investigation, but the supercargo was a fast worker. Through connections, he obtained the intervention of the captain of the United States cruiser Yorktown, then in port, and the Annie Larson was freed and ordered to sail at once. Plans called for the schooner to rendezvous with two small steamers off the Mexican coast and deliver the arms to the rebels, but the winds were not dependable, and a squall drove them up the coast. They worked their way south, and again a squall drove them north. By this time they were running short of water and provisions again, and rather than risk a, a Mexican port, the captain decided to try San Francisco. Well, according to the captain, when he told all some months later about the supercargo and what they wanted to do at the Golden Gate, he could see the thorough going on of a shakedown in the United States Customs would give them and he made the decision to go up the coast further. At first, they decided to try the mouth of the Columbia, but after some consideration, they set their course for Gray's Harbor. The plan was to slip into the harbor, replenish their water and supplies, then run out again down the coast to make their rendezvous with them off the coast of Mexico. It was the 30th of June, 1915, that the Annie Larson sailed into Grace Harbor and dropped her hook in the harbor's mud off of what is now the Hopeman Fish Base. Grace Harbor port surgeon hunter made his inspection of the at quarantine and hurried to report to the deputy collector of customs for Grace Harbor, all R. L. Sebastian. He reported a motley crew of seven, two of them Japanese. Captain Schultler, who had at one time sailed the Mabel Gale into port, and supercargo named Page. The doctor reported their papers out of order and indicated that in his opinion the crew would be a welcome would welcome a chance to jump ship if they had the opportunity. Sebastian's didn't waste any time. He got Sheriff Shell Matthews on the telephone and asked for some support. He expected trouble with the crew and wanted a few strong arms behind him. Well, you know what happened? The sheriff came down from Montesano with a couple of deputies, and Sebastian went out to the ship. He looked at the bill of lading and read foodstuffs, cotton goods, and tinware. They pried the lid off the boxes and brought out a model 1882 Springfield rifle complete with bayonet. Another box provided the same thing. By the time they had taken stock of the ship, they had turned up more than 4,000 rifles, a bayonet for each, and more than a million rounds of ammunition, cartridge belts, and enough other equipment to outfit a full-strength Mexican division. Of course, the customs collector filed his report with Seattle that very day, and the Seattle office instructed him to hold the ship and the supercargo. The captain and the men could go free. The Department of Justice was called in to investigate, and the harbor set itself for some real excitement. All of the crew except one Japanese man and one white sailor were released. The two men offered to stay aboard the ship as guards for the page, and the Department of Justice began to piece the story together. They got no cooperation from Page, and the ship's papers didn't show much. The captain only knew what, he, what had happened since Page came aboard in San Diego with his cargo. Who was to receive the arms? Who paid for them? Where did they come from? It was all a mystery to him. After three days, Page was still sitting on the Annie Larson. The case appeared no nearer to a solution. That was the day on which Page ordered a box of cigars from the little boat that brought provisions out to the ship each day. 
They delivered the cigars to him, and he passed them around to the crew members on the boat party. When the provisions boat put back to shore, Page plied his guards with cigars. They smoked and offered them more. Finally, he excused himself with the story that he was going to take a bath, and the guards lit more cigars. Well, Mr. Page was no fool. He wouldn't have been like that in that business if he had been lacking in either initiative or the capacity to carry out a scheme. While the guards puffed on their cheap stogies, Page swung over the ship's side, cut loose a boat, and started for the shore. His escape was not discovered until he was nearly a bush-lined shore of West Hoquiam. The guards fired several times, but their inaccuracy at the, that distance, and by the time they could summon help for sure, Page was gone, leaving an empty boat. For days, a manhunt went about Grace Harbor, not one with bloodhounds and posses. It was stealthy and undercover, with the Department of Justice doing the pursuing and Page playing the elusive hunt. And although the Justice Department agents were thorough, they never picked up the trail of Mr. Page, who disappeared right off the face of the map and no doubt went on to some more skullduggery somewhere else. There were plenty of South American revolutions in progress at that time, and lots of chores for persons with a talent to perform. But the Annie Larson was finally docked at the H Street Wharf in Aberdeen, about where Stouffer Bowman Company is today, and the arms and ammunition unloaded and stored in the old building on the corner of State and G Streets, now occupied by the Salvation Army. George Monroe, one of Grace Harbor's pioneer loggers, a brother to the famous Simon Mon Monroe, bullwhacker extraordinaire, got the job of guarding the arms and stood post around the building with a bulging 45 automatic on his pocket. The Annie Larson was returned to her owners who sailed her back to San Francisco and some years later, most of the arms and ammunition was sold to a junk dealer in Seattle. Not all of it, however, went to the Sound City. Enough of it was left behind to outfit the old home guard unit that patrolled the Grays Harbor waterfront and drilled in the Knights of Pythas Hall on First Street during World War I. And a lot of those old rifles, complete with bayonets, and some with bandoliers and ammunition, can be found in Grays Harbor attics today. Mementos of the ill-starred crews of the Annie Larson. I've got one myself, a single-shot breech-loaded rifle with needle bayonet and ramrod. It fired a slug that would stop an elephant, and except for a slight use in the Spanish-American War, it's a rifle that fortunately the forces of, the United, of Uncle Sam never had to rely on. In that respect, it might have been a good thing if the Mexican rebels had gotten them. They were apt to do more damage to the shooter than to those shot at. Now, Dick, come in for a few words from our sponsor. Some of these evenings, we're going to tell you about the Home Guard Unit of 1917 that did squads left and right on the high school lawn and marched to the Irish tenor marching airs of Harry Phipps and the bugle call condensed of H.P. Fetched Her. They cleaned and re-cleaned their antique 1882 rifles, polished their bayonets, and scrubbed the bandoliers. They were Aberdeen business and professional men of all ages. Some were almost too young for military service. One was a veteran of the Civil War. Some had degrees from military academies, and some had never carried a rifle in their lives. But they turned out and drilled, paraded when the community wanted to show a patriotic favor, and gave the harbor a feeling of solid security when the boys of 1917 were overseas on a more serious business. But it was a great old outfit, that Company H, Washington Home Guard, and the arms and ammunition were equipped with came into Grays Harbor on the venturesome little schooner Annie Larson, storm-beaten and out of water and provisions, in one of the most thrilling stories of gun running and intrigue that the harbor ever played a part in. And incidentally, 
the Annie Larson's papers were cleared for her last voyage and into the pages of our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.